What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. That's it right there. That's the Sherman. Holy sh that is amazing. This is incredible. So this thing actually saw action in Iwo Jima. This one did. It did see action. It was knocked out three times in the first 24 hours. How much you want for this thing? Um, I'm looking to get a million and a half. OK, but we get to drive it? You can drive it and you can shoot it. What do you think, Alex? I mean, it is what it is. It speaks for itself. Shermans are the most desired American tank from World War II. You know, I mean, I was thinking I could get into something like this for a couple hundred grand, but um, it's so out of the ballpark for me. <laughs> Today, we'll show you deals that were too rich for Pawn Stars blood. The Red Sox collection. In Boston, a tip from a friend pays off when Rick is shown an impressive Red Sox collection. Rick meets with a representative of the sellers who shows him every item in the collection. Rick. Hey, how's it going? All right, Pat. Welcome. Thanks for coming out here. Oh, thanks. We've got some amazing items here that I want to show you. Okay. This is the most extraordinary and unique collection of Red Sox team signed baseballs that you're going to find anywhere on the planet. It starts from 1901, which would be this ball right here, and all the five World Series they won with Babe Ruth. And this one is the first and earliest Babe Ruth signature that we know of that's out there on a baseball. That's incredible. The first this item is a Cy Young baseball card on offer for $150,000. This is an excellent piece. What this is is a cabinet card it's from 1893 signed by Cy Young. As far as we know, there's only six of these out there in the world. The best part about it is if you look over here, this actually comes in the envelope that he sent it with his handwriting. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's Cy Young, who's arguably the greatest baseball player ever to live. Yeah. He's a pitcher that won over 500 games. The world's largest baseball card. We're asking 175,000 for that. It's a little bit pricey. The final item is an autographed baseball that Ted Williams use for his 477th home run. The baseball is on sale for 50 grand. Ted Williams, 477 home run baseball. Super cool collection. So gloves off, what is the price of the Ted Williams ball? Our team will accept 50,000 for that ball. Okay. Rick's expert immediately admits that he has never seen such cool items outside the Baseball Hall of Fame. I'm gonna go give Steve a call. Just, okay. Yeah, I just want a little input here. Give me a few minutes, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go give him a call. Okay, great. So I guess you already know about this stuff. Yeah, it's some really great stuff. This is some of the best stuff I've ever seen outside of the Baseball Hall of Fame. So I really love number 477, Ted Williams. I think it's really, really cool. He's certainly still the most famous Red Sox player almost of all time. He comments that the items are museum quality and waste no time valuing the Cy Young card at $200,000 and the baseball for 65000 And then we have this Cy Young baseball card. This is a really fantastic piece of history. Cy Young, obviously, you know, really the greatest pitcher of all time. Two years after he died, they named the Cy Young Award after him. But the great thing about this, and I know the history about this piece, is this letter is tied in directly to this. So this is Cy Young sending this to someone. I don't know if you could ask for better provenance. So what do you think they're worth? You have two great pieces here, Rick. These are museum quality. So the first one, obviously, Cy Young, just focusing on this, how incredibly rare it is. I could easily see this going for $200,000. Okay, and the ball? So the baseball is really interesting, you know, and I love the letter, it ties it all in together. I put that value right at 65,000. Okay. Rick offers the seller $175,000 for both items. The seller counters with 225 grand and refuses to accept a dollar below 220,000. Okay, all right, so the ball and the Cy Young, I will give you 175 grand. For all of it. For these two right, yeah. I'm sorry. Just. I absolutely cannot do that. Our price is two and a quarter right now. And your best price is? My best offer? I'll give it all to you for 220. Rick increases his offers to 180 grand, and the two men part ways without a deal. My best offer is literally gonna be 180. I'm sorry, just can't do it that low. Okay, well, if you change your mind, let me know. Okay, but thanks a lot. I was disappointed that we couldn't come to an agreement on price, but we're gonna hold on to them. We know there's other interested buyers out there, and we know we'll get our price eventually. M483 Sherman Tank. Ron Cheney of Battlefield Las Vegas offers Rick, Chum, and Alex Cranmer, the weapons expert, one of the rarest items ever, an M4A3 Sherman tank that was used in the Battle of Iwo Jima. That's it right there. That's the Sherman. All right, we're here. Look at that tank. Holy sh that is amazing. The tank the guys are looking at right now is an M4A3 Sherman. What makes this tank special, it's the only Sherman tank in private hands that was actually used in the Pacific Theater. Real Marines jumped into during Iwo Jima, and now they can relive that history as well. Ron proudly tells Rick it is the only one of its kind in private hands. He tells him that the tank saw action and was knocked out three times, 
before it was taken out of commission. This is incredible. So this thing actually saw action in Iwo Jima. This one did. It did see action. It was knocked out three times in the first 24 hours. And it was finally taken out of service when they hit the turret at the turret bearing. And we met the gentleman who had to back it out. He's still alive today. I look at it, I just find it incredible because, I mean, it's from Iwo Jima. I mean, it's like when they raised the flag on Mount Suribashi, I mean, it's probably the most iconic photo of all of World War II. Chum Gross concerned that the tank is made of wood. Ron has to explain that Marines had to modify the tanks to stop being adhesive to Japanese mines. Well, guys, there's a major problem with this tank. It's made out of wood. You know what that's for? The Japanese had magnetic mines, sticky mines, that they would run up and stick to the side of a tank. So the Marines had to improvise and put wood paneling on the side and on the wheels of the track. So these guys were figuring this out and improvising as best they could to protect themselves. Okay. When they finally talk business, Rick gets dizzy at hearing the 1.5 million dollar asking price. How much you want for this thing? Um, I'm looking to get a million and a half. Okay, but we get to drive it? You can drive it and you can shoot it. It's pretty damn cool. Um, you need to go call Corey. Tell him to come down here. He doesn't want, he's not going to want to miss this, okay? All right. The guy's asking 1.5 million dollars and that kind of money, I'm thinking about it, but before I do anything, I'm going to have to fire it. After taking the tank for a ride and using its gun to blow up a car, Rick decides to pass on the offer despite Alex advising him the deal is a steal. Wish me luck. Got it. No <laughs> worries. Oh my God. That was amazing. <laughs> nice job, Rick. What do you think, Alex? I mean, it is what it is. It speaks for itself. Shermans are the most desired American tank from World War II. It runs well. It fires well. It's got historical provenance from Iwo Jima. There is one that we know of that sold in the last year that wasn't documented to being at any major battle in the World War II, and it was sold for $1.2 million. So at $1.5 million, I, I think that's a fair price. OK, let's get out of here. I'll meet you at the Humvee. You know, I mean, when me and Alex started discussing me buying a tank, I was thinking I could get into something like this for a couple hundred grand uh, because they made like 50,000 of these, right? A, a little more than that. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's got amazing history. Everything about it is absolutely great, but um, it's so out of the ballpark for me. <laughs> but I really, really appreciate the day. It's been an unbelievable day. Thanks, man. Amazing day. It is simply too rich for his blood. Peggy Eames Gibson guitar. Rick is in disbelief when Paul shows him a vintage 1938 Gibson guitar. More than the guitar's rarity, Rick is impressed that it was custom made for Paul's mother the famous child actor Peggy Eames of the R Gang film series. I have a vintage guitar. It was custom made for my mother, Okay, Peggy Eames, who was in R Gang comedies. Really? Cool. Well, yeah, it was R Gang for years until it went on television, then it was The Little Rascal. Correct. And this was your mom's guitar? Yes, a one of a kind Gibson. Though Rick is more interested in recounting the history of R Gang, he finally pauses for a breath and Paul shows Rick the guitar's provenance. When was she on the Little Rascals, our, our gag? They were just forming it up in 1925. She won a contest with a trip to Hollywood to go and try out for our gang. So she got in with the our gang bunch while they were still doing silent movies. This was one of her our gang movies, Seeing the World. She's right here. Okay. Those are some pretty cool pictures. So do you have any pictures with her, with the guitar? Uh, yes. All right, there we go, here's, right there. Here's where she starts playing the guitar. When she got too old to be in the R gang, she started doing stage acts, singing, dancing. She wanted a guitar to do her act. She went to Gibson. It's probably one of the first SJs, super jumbos, that Gibson made. Really? Okay. Though the guitar has a steep $75,000 asking price, Rick does not shrink away because he knows that collectors fight over pre-war Gibsons. I mean, it looks in absolutely great shape. You rarely see 75-year-old guitars because ones besides Gibsons would fall apart. Mm. All right, so is this supposed to be your mom right here? Yes. Okay. So what do you want to do with it? Uh, I'm looking for a value of 75000 Okay. A pre-war Gibson is a rare find. I mean, I, I've paid as high as $90,000 for a Gibson in here. And if this is a real 1938 Gibson Super Jumbo, it could be worth a ton. Do you mind if I call somebody up and take a look at it? Uh, that'd be very good. He calls Jesse Amoroso, the owner of Cowtown Guitars, for a professional evaluation. Jesse singles out the guitar as one of the most iconic sounding Gibsons, 
and evaluates its exterior. We have a really early Gibson, potentially a 1938. Wow, that's an early, early, early one. Well, if it's a 38, it's a super jumbo. It's the first year that they made these, and it came to be one of Gibson's most famous guitars. Everybody has played and recorded with uh, super jumbo, Neil Young, La Who. So to have a first year production, that's a big deal. You mind if I pick it up and take a look at it? Uh, go ahead. Cool. He's very pleased that the rosewood has been expertly preserved over the years. Back looks in good shape. It's all rosewood. No cracks on the back. It's a nice piece of maple, it looks like, maybe on the neck there. You got maybe one crack right here. The biggest thing is if there is a number on the inside of it ink stamped in there. Well, yeah, this is 1938 for sure. It's got a D for the letter, and that was only used in 1938. Desi values the guitar at $40,000 without the customization, which nearly doubles the valuation to between $70,000. Do you guys have any other concerns with the guitar? Or? Uh, no, I think he covered everything except that one big one, what's it worth? Well, without that custom work on it, in this condition, this is probably a $40,000 guitar. The custom stuff on it takes it into a different realm. So you have a first year guitar with custom stuff on it. This could possibly be 65, maybe even 70 grand for this guitar. Rick and the client failed to agree due to the huge gap between his $47,000 offer and the client's $65,000 bottom price. I'll give you $45,000 for the guitar. Well, my intention was that the money would be used as a down payment on like a getaway cottage, call it Peggy's Cabin. My asking price, 75, is really where I still want to stay on it. There's very few people in the world who have enough money to spend a stock 1938 guitar. You bump that up to the few guys who buy the custom ones, it could take me years to sell something like this. That's what I can do. I mean, I will go $45,000 if you were the end collector, is it of interest to you? Uh, that's just it. I'm not the end collector. 65 would probably move me on it. I'll go 47. I assume all the risk after that. You know what I mean? I, I think I'll haul it around a little bit longer. Okay. If you change your mind, I'm here. Buffalo Nickel Statue. A regular client who sells red coins brings him a sculpture that was part of the original artwork used in designing the Buffalo Nickel. Jeff, how's it going? Doing pretty good, Rick. How you doing? Okay. What in the world is this? Well, usually I bring you coins, but uh, this is coin related. This is original artwork made by James Earl Frazier for the Buffalo Nickel. I brought you some nickels so that you can refresh your memory about what coin we're talking about. Okay. It is one of the most beautiful coins we ever had. Rick admires the James Earl Fraser sculpture and declares his design is much better than the one he was hired to replace. He then launches into a seemingly endless lecture about the magnificent artwork seen in American coins over the years. This is pretty cool. A few years after Teddy Roosevelt became president, he basically went to the Met and said, like, guys, we have the ugliest coins in the world. Roosevelt basically tells the Met, design some beautiful coins. I mean, that time period from 1908 through the 1930s, you know, we had the Mercury, Mercury Dime. Dime right? We had the Walking Liberty, the Standing Liberty, and the Buffalo Nickel. We carried artwork on our pocket. A lot of people actually call this period the renaissance of American coinage. As soon as negotiations kick off, it becomes clear the two men are miles apart. The client wants $20,000, and Rick offers 10000 So, do you know how many of these exist? Just that one. It is totally unique. All right. So, how much you want for it? I would part with it for $20,000. What about ten? I would not part with it for 10000 It's really museum quality, so yeah. I, I guess I would sell it for eighteen. dollars Rick states $15,000 as his final offer, but the client refuses to budge beneath 18000 I mean, I'd go $15,000. that would be it. I think I'll pass. He insists the statue is done in plaster of Paris and is quite delicate. The client insists that the sculpture is museum quality and the only one of its kind in existence. I mean, here, here's the tough part. It's plaster of Paris. It's not like something by Fraser that was done in bronze. Yep. Plaster of Paris yep. is not made to last. I really think it belongs in a museum, and for the meantime, I'll just leave it on my desk. Maybe next time. We'll try again. Both men are disappointed not to have made a deal. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching it. Make sure to comment and hit that like and subscribe button too. Hit that notification bell for more videos like this. Share this video to your family and friends. See you soon.